Okay. Hi, Betsy. How are you? Hi, Douglas. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. It's nice to have you here. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for the opportunity. So you got a book called The Illusion of the Perfect Profession. And when I read through the description, I mean, this is a very tragic story. Yeah? It is. It's been, yeah, it's, it's been a journey. I will say that for sure. How long ago did, uh, did this happen? So this happened on Thanksgiving Day 2019. So just a little over four years ago. Okay. Do you want to tell us kind of briefly what happened and well, sure. I'll start at the beginning. Um, okay. My uh, my late husband and I, uh, his name was Matthew Golf. He was an oncologist. Um, we moved from Minneapolis, Minnesota, down to the Charlotte area in North Carolina um, for him to start um, a new job with a smaller private practice. And um, things the job wasn't exactly what um, Matthew had expected. And immediately he felt like he had made a, a, a grave mistake in moving here. And I urged him to um, quit and maybe we just look for a different job. Um, he, he really uh, couldn't wrap his head around that. We had only been here for about a week when he started saying things like, I think this was career suicide and I feel like I'm watching um, a fatal car crash. And I kind of couldn't wrap my head around that because I was like, Matt, it's a job and we'll just move. We'll leave. We, um, we had kept our lake house up in northern Minnesota. So I thought, you know what, we even have a home to go back to if we uh, want to go that route. And um, he had a non-compete in Minneapolis and a non-compete here in North Carolina. And uh, he just felt that that was not an option. So uh, he fell into a really deep depression and it was very unlike him. Uh, he could not get off the couch. He wouldn't do any of the things that he loved um, doing, like bike. He was a big bicyclist. Uh, he loved to mow the lawn. He liked to do simple things like grill. Uh, he just he he couldn't do anything. It was actually just very um, chaotic and out of character for him, and so uh, really scary. And. Um, because he was a physician, he kept saying things like, I can't get help because I could lose my medical license. And I thought that was very strange. I didn't know if it was true or not, but he, um, he definitely felt that way. We had a physician friend that I had been confiding in who lived up in Minneapolis, and he kept urging Matt to, you know, get on an antidepressant, exercise, um, and see a psychiatrist. And Matt really wouldn't do any of those things. And he actually completely stopped sleeping. Uh, and that was pretty scary. He was still working. He was still going to work every day, but he stopped sleeping. So um, the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, Matt became suicidal. And it was awful. And I talk about it. It's the first page of my book. Um, I write about that night and um, my son and my brother-in-law actually um, got the gun out of Matt's hand. He was in our master bathroom and they took him to the ER. And while he was there, um, they did not have a psych unit there. They had a physician come in and examine him and Matt told the attending ER doctor that he was just exhausted and, um, you know, that he was not suicidal. Um, so my brother-in-law and my son brought him back home and they, they said that they had given him a sleeping pill, which I was thrilled about because I thought, oh, he'll finally be able to sleep. And um, so went to sleep, I think it was around 1130 that night. Um, and woke up about 
oh, I don't know, it was like four or five in the morning to Matt saying what's going to happen. And I was really perplexed. I was like, oh, the sleep med didn't work. And I said, Matt, I think we need to go to the ER. I think we need this. You, you need some help. And he um, he said he didn't want to go, but he did end up getting dressed. And we, I was going to take him to the to the hospital. I was essentially in the garage um, waiting for him to come into the car, and uh, I heard a gunshot go off. Um, okay. okay, let me. So I. Yep. Let me just interrupt you here because I, okay. I have a couple of questions. And okay. the first one is, why didn't they take the gun away from him? Your brother-in-law, whatever. I mean, once he had gone to the hospital initially, you know. The, they, I, they did. They did. Okay. They did. Yeah. Sorry, it's probably confusing with me telling the story versus reading the story, but um, they did take the gun away from Matt. Okay. The, and the second, our theory... Okay, go ahead. The second question, which you can answer after you finish on this one, was what was different about his practice from Minnesota to North Carolina? Because seemingly he was okay in Minnesota? Yes, and to be honest with you, Douglas, I can't go into all of that. It's I just, it wasn't a good fit. Okay. Let's just leave, I, I can leave it at that. All right. So go ahead on your other train of thought. Uh, so I was essentially in the garage waiting for Matt to come into the car. And he didn't come, didn't come. And so I walked back into the house. It was dark out. And I opened the door to the backyard. I had seen that it was unlocked. And so I opened the door to the backyard and I was like whispering, Matt, are you out there? Are you out there? And I could hear some rustling in the bushes. And so I knew that he was out there. So I, I said, you're scaring me. You need to get in the car. And I said, I'm going to call 911. And he said something like, are there going to be sirens? And I was like so confused and my heart was beating a million miles per minute. So I ran back into the garage and I got my phone. I called 911 and that's when I heard the shot go off. So he must have planted a gun in the backyard. Um, we had these like bushes around this kind of decrepit old hot tub. So that's our theory um, was that he had planted this gun and that it had been planned. So you had more than one gun? Yes. Okay. All right. So let me pivot over to your book because we've got just a few minutes. Um, so the book says that it's a compilation of your journals. <coughs> Were these written after his suicide, I assume? No. No? No. When we got to North Carolina, it was, like I said, this was completely out of character for my husband. He was the happiest guy you ever met. He loved being an oncologist. He loved our three children. Um, he loved his patients and he loved me. And so when we when we made this transition, this mood, and there were some things that led up to the move um, that were just very, very stressful. Um, we, we, we got to North Carolina and like I said, it was chaotic and confusing. And I literally felt like I was kind of floating watching somebody else's life go on because this was just not where we had come from. We had had a pretty basic, normal, all-American life. Um, and so I would walk around my neighborhood and I would cry and just kind of talk to God. And I just felt this whisper like, you've got to write, you've got a journal, you've got to write. So that's where the writing and my journaling came in. You know, I've done it on and off for years, but I'm a real estate agent. <laughs> I'm not a writer by trade. So the um, that's where the whole writing came in. And then after Matt died, I started researching because it's very complex when we lose a doctor to suicide. My husband um, went to work every single day to save lives. And when you stop and think about that, 
the fact that he took his own, it's just, it, there are, I still can't believe it. And so I started researching and, you know, here I come to find out that we lose over 400 doctors a year to suicide. And it's kind of like all these, these healthcare workers and physicians know they're at high risk, yet nobody wants to talk about it. Um, it's a very tough subject to talk about. You know, physicians are um, taught to show no weakness. They're supposed to have all the answers all the time. And um, they, Matt really thought he couldn't get help because of the invasive questioning that they do on some of the state medical licensing board exams. So I started researching all of this, and that's when my writing and my journaling and my research kind of turned into the book. So this is a that's bigger together. This is a bigger problem than probably a lot of people realize. A physician. Oh, absolutely, right? absolutely. And I have found just being, you know, open and honest about what happened. Um, that's a real problem. I mean, it's a real problem. I speak all over the country now on this issue. I'm not a mental health expert, but I was married to a physician for 20 years. And it was, and that's kind of how I start the book out. I mean, I kind of have this fairy tale life. And, you know, physicians are very well respected. And Matt was very well loved by his patients. And nobody knows what, how much stress these these doctors of ours are under behind the scenes. It is constant and 24 seven and it's rigorous. And here they go in to this profession to help people. And the system is very broken and it's, it's really, really tough. And we just lost a resident, Dr. West in the DC area about two weeks ago. He was a, a resident physician um, to suicide. It's awful and it's tragic. And, um, you know, our doctors are in an elite class. They spend a lot of money trying to, you know, going to med school, getting into med school, and then they get into residency. Um, it's rigorous, long hours with not a lot of sleep. And a lot of them are struggling with depression. Um, many self medicate. And it's quite uh, scary, frankly, because we are right now, we actually have a doctor shortage and it's only going to continue to get worse. So when we lose a doctor, um, you know, because they leave the profession because it's just too stressful or to suicide, um, unfortunately, it's just it creates this, you know, even bigger gap for this shortage that we're facing. So I, I wrote the book to raise awareness and I hope that another family never has to go through what we have um, endured. But I, I pick up my phone and I get calls from spouses frequently since I've written the book, you know, saying your story is my story, which is really sad. Well, Betsy, unfortunately we are out of time. We're gonna have to wind this down. Again, the book is called The Illusion of the Perfect Profession. Uh, is the book out? Has it been released? It is. It's out. You can get it on Amazon. And um, I really appreciate you having me on the show. Uh, do you have a website that you want to give out? You know what? I don't have a website, but you can find me on Instagram or Facebook if you just type in Betsy Gall. Okay. I'm public on both of those. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and uh, best of luck with the book. Hope it does well. Thank you. I appreciate the time.